Thank you. Okay, so here we go. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Nice to see you all. I want to welcome you to the first day of this year's Honors Showcase, where our 19 graduating honor students will share with you their capstone projects. Uh, thank you so much for coming today and for your various kinds of support for honor students. Really appreciate you um, coming by. So just a few housekeeping notes before we start. Um, we will have four presenters today, uh, about 10 minutes each person. <clears throat> Excuse me, after that, um, you, our audience members, will have a chance to interact with our presenters. Um, once all four people are done uh, presenting, you can raise your hand and we'll call on you to make a comment or ask a question. And you can also feel free to use the chat and uh, Lisa and I will be following that to get your questions answered. Um, we will be recording the session, just so you know, and um, it will be available at a later date, probably on the Honors uh, Showcase page and perhaps also in our Honors Program Library Archives. Um, so you will be recorded today. Um, some of our other students could not present live this week and they did pre-record their sessions, which um, will, if they're not there already, they will be shortly on the Honor Showcase page. So you'll have a chance to see a few more students there as well. Um, okay, so I think we are ready. And um, first I would like to introduce our first presenter, uh, Selena Brazil. Uh, Selena has um, recorded a YouTube video presentation, which we are going to play for you. Um, so Lisa, if you're ready, you can pull that up. And Selena, um, we're going to run your presentation now. So sit back and enjoy, folks, and we'll see you in a little over 10 minutes. Nothing's playing yet, Lisa. We can see it, Lisa. You can see it? Okay, let me try it again. Go ahead and press play. Volume's a little bit low, Lisa. We better start it again, Lisa, because the volume is quite low. Lisa, can't hear it, and could you maybe turn the closed captions on if there are any? I can't close, close caption. I can't find it. Okay. <clears throat> Lisa, are you sharing your computer sound? Uh, someone just said it might be. Yep. Okay. Should we try um, for Selena to share it herself, or what do you think? Oh my God, it won't stop. <laughs> Thanks. Have Selena do it because it's not working. It's not going louder. Selena, will you be able to share your screen um, so we can see if that solves the problem? We yep. got to make One her co-host. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Okay, she's a co-host.
No sound, Selena? I'm sorry? Can't hear any sound. You can't hear any sound? No. It's that mm -hmm. little button clicked in the lower left-hand corner when you go to share your screen. You have to click a little button in order for it to show the computers. Uh, uh, audio. It's a YouTube video, so I don't know if it'll do that. I know the Zoom ones well, the PowerPoints well. Yeah. Mm. You know what, I just, I just presented um, last week in Zoom and showed a PowerPoint video, uh, showed a YouTube video. And um, just like Bob was saying, like when you go and hit share screen in the Zoom, um, you know, the bar that says share screen, there is like a little box and you have to have that clicked off or otherwise you won't hear anything. Like you can hear it on your end, but not yeah. uh, people listening in. Yeah, I don't have that either. Uh, suggestion to stop the share and try again. I think that's a good idea. Yeah. Okay. So when you hit share screen, it's on that that pops up, right, guys? Is that what I'm hearing? Yes, it's there's a little button right in the far. Oh, I found it. I found it. Okay. I found it. I got it. The sh share sound. Yeah. Yep. Click right. that share sound. There you go. Increase. Hello, my name is Selena Brazil, and my research presentation is on climate change and the displacement of life. The development of climate change in the last few decades has played a consequential hand in the recent occurrence of large-scale human migration for people looking to better their living situations. These circumstances are a result of global factors that span communities, including resource scarcity, increased frequency of extreme weather events, increased number and severity of disease outbreaks, and increased U.S. border stress due, the, due to the effects of climate change in parts of Central America. In my research, I intend to provide insight on three cases discussing climate change and environmental degradation, which is fueled by unchecked corporate exploitation of resources and results in the displacement and disenfranchisement of people. While climate change is a moderate contributor to migration rather than the sole factor, corporations have a heavy hand in thrusting people out of their homes at an increased rate due, their, due to their destruction of land and resources. This research sheds light onto the role of multinational corporations and how they play a significant part in international relations while highlighting the environmental devastation experienced in different parts of the world. In exploring this relationship, one important factor appears quite clear, namely that corporations privatize, enclose, and profit from natural and social resources of defenseless people with little care for the Earth's environment. The biological and cultural diversity is relentlessly destroyed, including land, pollution of water, choking air, and crushing souls. Locals watch helpless as these multi-million dollar corporations destabilize their vast, fruitful landscapes into pathetic wastelands. The visible deterioration of biodiversity, increase of pollution, and ocean acidification is a heavy contributor to the gradual push people have to leave their situation. Globally, families escape their increasingly unsafe and unprofitable native economic areas for the well-being of their family. The environment that most immigrants flee from have eroded after years of abuse by corporations that suck their natural resources until they cannot provide any longer. Regarding this research, climate displaced individuals typically do not fall under the legal term refugee due to its limiting definition of people fleeing persecution owing to factors such as their race, ethnicity, creed, or political beliefs. The international community may soon be forced to either redefine refugees to include climate migrants or create a new legal category in order to protect those who've been displaced by severe climate change. This is important because lack of international legislation to categorize people as climate refugees leaves them vulnerable and it takes away the accountability from the responsible parties, such as corporations, corrupt governments, sinister policies, and so on. The project piqued my interest due to my firsthand experience living in a predominantly immigrant community on the border of Mexico. My peers had immediate family members who would regularly travel across the border to work for American agricultural companies in the fields. Many had expressed that the jobs were little in local economies due to government interference on local agriculture orchestrated by U.S. corporations. This method is used by many corporations to force farmers to become dependent on the help of outside services tailored to sustaining their hidden agenda to, of improving their profits and gain workers to control after the land is tarnished. This research allows me to study the connection between corporate interests, politics, and the environment, and draw a network of interrelationships between them. 
Most often, it is a poor global South that gets displaced, as well as other vulnerable communities. This research will focus on the displacement and decay of life as a direct result of the degradation of the environment in three gruesome and catastrophic cases situated in three separate continents. Vale SA is a Brazilian multinational corporation involved in metal mining. It is a company that has contributed to the degradation of Brazil's ecosystem. Thousands of families in Rio Doce Basin were affected in the incident referred to as Brazil's worst environmental disaster, where 50 million cubic meters of mineral waste was carried into an important utility river. Iron waste got dumped into a local village's water, which caused ecological implications due to toxic mud contaminating the land. Damages range from destruction of cultural heritage, 19 confirmed deaths, displacing locals, and destroying two villages. Three indigenous ethnic groups were affected, along with tons of rotting fish perishing in the thick, foul mud. The ecosystem was damaged, the fish whose habitat was rocked, and fortunately suffered horrific population damage. The Rio Dulce is a vital source for the community as it provides exports of agriculture, industrial materials, and mining for raw matter. Vail SA was later directly linked to another environmental tragedy. Four years after the, after the Mariana mining disaster in Brazil, another toxic dam broke. The failure of this specific multinational corporation to properly control their mining areas resulted in the further destruction of native Brazilian biodiversity. This destructive incident was characterized by the casting of iron ore tailings into the region's river soil and the death of 232 people in Brumadino, Minas Gerais. Whole environments are affected due to the mismanagement of huge corporations who will continue to suck the resources of an area until there's no more left to give. The impact of this event continues its toxicity today with high levels of sediment from the spill, which can be detrimental to local livelihoods, human health, infrastructure, such as hydropower and water treatment facilities, as well as ecosystems. Villages were displaced, forcing its natives to migrate away from their tainted homes in search of safe environments to raise their families without risk of disease and becoming corporate casualties. Many natives deal with polluted environments for years, such as the Rio Dose community. community. Companies barrel into the native environments to exploit their natural resources while bringing in hazardous substances in order to easily access the materials they seek without thought to how it will affect the indigenous people and their ecosystem in long-term regard. They lived with the accumulation of unsustainable mining, deforestation, poorly managed agriculture, and insufficient sewage treatment in most communities around, along the river. This horrific large-scale environmental tragedy are more of a tipping point for many. The victims have no control over their destiny. These natives are socially and culturally displaced. Another example of climate change due to the negative impact of corporate agenda is at the birthplace of humanity, Lake Victoria, Tanzania. The introduction of the predatory Nile perch as an export cash product into the lake had a devastating impact on the local community and the environment. The Nile perch was brought into Lake Victoria's environment by the Uganda Game and Fisheries Department in 1954 with the intention to develop the fisheries profitability overseen by the British administration. The introduction of this invasive fish has led to a myriad of social and political consequences, such as the destruction of biodiversity and the emerging monoculture of decay, which resulted in the breakup of communities and families, prostitution and starvation in the region. Those who have benefited from the decay of the surrounding ecological system includes the global north, a classification of developed countries that share similar economical characteristics located primarily in the Northern Hemisphere, and the Nile Perch's biggest foreign importer, the European Union. Capitalism has continued to exploit developing areas such as Africa of its resources, reaping the wealth that comes from the destruction of a native economy and its people. This creates dependence on foreign capitalist corporations who benefit from and control the area's valuable fishing industry. The reduction in species and functional diversity restructured the lake's eco ecology, the Nile Perch is a major contributor to the shift, such as increased economic stratification, species loss, and the fact that most Nile Perch is exported and locally unaffordable. The quality of life of communities around, the, around Lake Victoria has suffered since the introduction of the Nile Perch. The government has continually showed disregard for the extreme poverty and malnourishment its citizens face daily. There are multiple policies that protect commercial fishers, including industries at the direct expense of traditional fishing communities. Funds are often reinvested into the fishing industry with disregard for improving the economic opportunities within the community or reducing the poverty level. Children lack proper education focused on enter entering the fishing industry, continuing the cycle of dependency on corporations that want to exploit marginalized communities that try to make a living. Women turn to prostitution in order to provide. This in turn has resulted in high rates of HIV and AIDS in the fishing community. The lack of development in other areas in the surrounding Lake Victoria's communities shows how dire the situation is 
which fortunately has been ongoing for years. The Nile perch is a predatory animal that savagely consumes other fish in its region. When the diversity of the lake begins to die off, the lake begins to die as well due to the fact that the ecosystem becomes unhealthy and toxic. At some point, the lake will collapse. The third and final case will examine the impact of exploitation of natural resources in Mexico by corporations such as Monsanto Bayer. The use of GMO crops in the enclosure of natural resources in Mexico has displaced thousands of people. Mexico's heavily agricultural economy was dealt with a heavy blow when in 2009, Mexican government had granted permits to multinational corporations to cultivate genetically modified corn. This hybridized corn causes irreversible contamination to Mexico's agriculture if it is allowed to be exposed to soil. And native Mexican protesters sought to reject future cultivation and spread of this invasive crop. According to Teddy Basham Witherington on their article regarding the agricultural issue, the introduction of the genetically modified corn into Mexican agriculture, quote, threatened the diversity and integrity of native corn strains, which endangered the livelihoods of low income family farmers, small producers, bee and beekeepers who depended on selling the native corn and its derivative products, unquote. Monsanto, described as the leader in agricultural biotechnology, is infamous for their awful business practices. It has previously been recorded that thousands of small farmers have fallen victim to their despicable tactics of intimidation and restrictions imposed on them throughout Monsanto's business span. Monsanto, as well as other large corporations, often are knowingly complicit in the degradation of biodiversity in developing countries, as well as its negative impact on farmers. Monsanto is an example of how hyper-focused companies are on profit and how they barrel through local citizens without consideration to how it will affect them long term. This company displays a preference of victimizing farmers in order to induce dependence and monopolize a large share of the corn and soybeans markets. Many of the thousands of farms who have been victim of the vicious bullying of multinational corporations are pushed to look outside their environments for work. In search of survival, people turn to illegal activities or become immigrants. Instances such as this, where U.S. corporate interference led to immigration, is an example of common conditions that push people to leave their homes. My perception is that the misconception that many people fall victim into believing is based on local government propaganda that does not discuss this aspect. Immigrants have legitimate and valid reasons for offending their lives in order to pursue a vision to provide their families with the most secure living conditions possible. The destruction of the biodiversity in culturally significant areas devastates their inhabitants, Growing up in Arizona, I saw firsthand the people whose lives are upended. Throughout my research into the relationship between the concepts of climate change and corporate displacement, it has encouraged me to delve into the typical business tactics of these companies. I've discovered that the corporations that are guilty of infringing over the rights of farmers in developing areas are often protected other, under governmental policies. Corporations and governmental agencies benefit each other in order to make a profit at the expense of harming the biodiversity and economy of areas rich in natural resources. The government needs to be more stringent in how it protects consumer health and the environment instead of developing an alliance between the biotechnology industry. I believe that there should be more reversal motions toward these governmental policies that allow current predatory behavior from corporations. These incidents are not coincidence, it's deliberate, and it is a term referred to as disaster capitalism. These companies make money off of disasters. They benefit from it by recruiting labor or by attempting to cure the area after it's been affected. Biological pollution has gotten to deplorable points within the last 30 years, and the connection between corporate interests, politics, and the environment illustrate the need for more sustainable relationships between them. Selena, thank you so much. Um, really eye-opening research. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, for those of you who might have come in a few minutes after the start of the hour, just a little reminder that um, we are going to go through all four of our presenters today and then there'll be time for questions um, at the end. Okay, so thank you so much, Selena. And next, our second presenter uh, this morning is Catherine Haley, who will be uh, narrating uh, live her PowerPoint. So um, Lisa will be pulling that up in just a moment. and. Uh, Katie, you can be ready to go. Sounds good. <clears throat> so Lisa, we're having that same issue as before where I'm seeing your um, sign-in screen, but not actually the, the PowerPoint itself. Just give us one second to solve that problem. There we go. 
Uh, Katie, will you be asking Lisa to advance the slides? Yes. Okay. Can you see it now? Yes. yes. I'll okay. send you. Go ahead and. Okay, Katie, take it away. Thank you very much, Denise. And Lisa, thank you very much. Thank you everybody for coming. Um, my name is Katie and I'm an addict. That is the way I've introduced myself for the last three years of my life. And I was given so much by a community of recovering addicts. Over the last 14 months, I have seen relapse, degradation and death, which spurred me on to do this project because from that community, I was brought from homelessness to being accepted to an Ivy League institution. And I so badly want to do whatever I can to fix a problem that I'm seeing in my community. Next slide, please. So what we're seeing is that over the last year, COVID-19 has taken the lives of over half a million Americans. By June, 2020, we had already begun to see the effects of isolation um, on mental health. In a survey of 5,412 adults at that time, 40.9% reported at least one adverse mental or behavioral condition. And of that 40.9%, 13.3 revealed that they had started or increased their substance use to help them cope with the COVID-19 pandemic. So while the pandemic has taken so many lives and has been tragic in its own right, we cannot underestimate the toll that it has taken on mental health. Next slide, please. In 2020, the United States saw its highest increase in overdose deaths at 6.8% in history. In 2019, that, rate, that amount was 70,630. And in 2020, it was 81,000 deaths from drug overdose. That is the highest in recorded history. Massachusetts, however, has managed to stay far below that number at just 2% of an increase in the first nine months of 2020. Within New England, at roughly, in roughly the same time period, fatal overdoses increased by 26% in Rhode Island and 24% in Maine. In short, the American Medical Association wrote to the DEA in November of 2020, and they said that more than 40 states had seen an increase in overdose deaths during the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide, please. So this, of course, leads to the question, what is Massachusetts doing? to mitigate a drastic rise in overdose deaths during the COVID-19 pandemic. While we have seen a rise, it is nothing like other states in New England or across the country. Next slide, please. So first, I'm gonna talk a little bit about detox and acute treatment for drug addiction in Massachusetts. Massachusetts has 178 detox facilities and they take state insurance like MassHealth and Medicaid. Rhode Island has about half that many inpatient facilities for acute treatment. Many inpatient facilities had to limit their capacity due to COVID-19. So the fact that we had so many treatment facilities kind of fix, um, fixed the problem before it even started. It gave us a better head start than surrounding states. Next slide, please. So to talk about my next point, I first must explain Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Now Maslow said that you must meet the base needs before you can move up in the pyramid, right? So we first must meet air, water, food, shelter needs before we can move up to taking care of our health, getting employment, and things like self-actualization, becoming the best version of yourself. Next slide, please. So in that same vein, we must think of homelessness as the first issue we need to take care of before we can move on. So most homeless shelters are considered dry shelters. Dry shelters are places where you cannot use drugs or drink. If you do, you will be kicked out. In Rhode Island, after I called several state agencies, such as the Rhode Island Coalition for the Homeless, I was able to find only one shelter that is considered wet, where you do not need to be fully clean and sober, and that's Crossroads in Providence. Now in Massachusetts, there are 39 emergency homeless shelters funded by the state. Of those, 18 are considered wet shelters where you do not have to be completely clean and sober to receive help. Now, if you do come in and you're drinking or you've been using drugs, you're asked to go and you know isolate from the rest of the population, but you have those basic physiological needs met where you are warm, you're housed, you're fed, 
And you can start to think about things like your health. Maybe this isn't what I want for myself. And you're not just out on the street cold. Next slide, please. Next, I wanna talk a little bit about aftercare in Massachusetts. Uh, it's been shown that longer stays in treatment facilities and structured programs give individuals suffering from substance use disorder a better chance of achieving long-term remission, which is defined as 12 months or more of complete abstinence. Massachusetts funds several amazing options for long-term treatment, including recovery high schools for teenagers, residential services for families so that children can stay with their parents in a structured, safe, monitored setting, recovery homes, intensive outpatient programs, and many more that are unique to Massachusetts. Next slide, please. Harm reduction is one of the best in Massachusetts across the country. We distribute large amounts of naloxone, which is an overdose reversing agent to first responders, people that are likely to have overdoses and their families. There are also community programs or recovery specialists that partners with, with first responders and they follow up at a home where overdoses occur. They encourage them to go to treatment. And if they don't want to, they teach them how to use naloxone and encourage them to use clean needles. By late 2020, at least 34 towns and cities offered needle exchange services. So while needle exchange programs are important because they lessen the spread of bloodborne illnesses like HIV and Hep C. They also can be a place where people go and say, hey, I want treatment, where do I start? And they have the answers to that at these community programs. Next slide, please. Next, uh, Massachusetts has done amazing public awareness campaigns. They expanded um, the Good Samaritan law in 2016, which protects addicts. If they call 911 for an overdose, they cannot be arrested for possession or use of illegal substances. They've run um, commercials and put up billboards about the fact that they expanded the Good Samaritan law. And finally, this is something that I love, uh, the State Without Stigma is another uh, public awareness campaign they've run. It encourages all Massachusetts residents to be supportive of addicts in recovery as well as those seeking recovery. And just a new public uh, awareness video in 2020 to continue to bring awareness to the stigma of addiction and how to combat it, as well as how to be a good ally to those suffering from substance use disorder. Next slide, please. So just being aware of the time, um, I just wanna say medication assisted treatment, it's been reported to be very successful. It's one of the most successful modes of treatment. Um, and Massachusetts has an entire task force aimed at broadening MAT availability because the availability is the main obstacle to people getting into MAP programs, that's what they're called. And, um, you know, the fact that they, their stated goals are to examine any barriers to MAP programs and they project the future need for MAP programs. Um, you know, the fact that they have a whole task force aimed at that could be one of the reasons that we're staying below the national overdose death in the last year. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the past, present and future colliding in this last year. While Massachusetts is doing better than the national average of overdose deaths, it and most of the country still have a long way to go in terms of efficacy of treatment. Now the Harrison Act of 1914 put a prohibition on hard drugs but left a deliberate loophole. Doctors could still pre prescribe drugs like heroin and cocaine to addicts to treat their addiction. During the later uh, 1910s and the early 1920s, three quarters of self-described addicts, and this is not just users, these are addicts, had steady and respectable jobs. Some 22% of addicts were wealthy and only 6% were poor. Although it would have been better for them to stop, they were rarely out of control or criminal because they were getting their drugs from doctors, not off of the street. So Harry Anslinger, the first head of the Bureau of Narcotics, closed the loophole that gave doctors the power to prescribe narcotics. And he essentially, um, gave organized crime a new market on a silver platter. He served it up to them and uh, doctors were, their um, prescribing power was taken away. So today, more than 75% of drug related violence is gang violence, not the result of an addict robbing someone or acting violently because they're high, it's gang violence. Next uh, slide, please. So I'm gonna to talk to you guys a little bit about Rat Park because I think it's important to talk about efficacy of treatment. It's an important study to look at. So in a study done by Bruce Alexander in 2010, he conducted an experiment with rats. In nature, rats are very social, sexual, and industrious. With some of the rats, he did what other studies had done before. He put them in 
an isolated cage with just a regular bottle of water and a drugged bottle of water. No other rats, no toys. And in another cage, he dubbed it Rat Park, they were given colored balls, blocks, platforms to climb, and other rats to interact with. In both cages, um, they had the drugged water and the plain water. And in the isolated cage, they almost always used the drug water um, compulsively, and they almost always overdosed and died from that drugged water in the isolated cage. But here's the thing. In Rat Park, they didn't like the drugged water. They almost never used it. And when they did, they never used it compulsively. That's amazing. So that begs the question, what if addiction isn't about the chemical hooks of drugs like heroin and cocaine? What if it's about the cage in which the addict resides? Next slide, please. So Portugal has created a great framework on how to change the addict's cage. They decriminalized all drugs. They used to be as punitive about their drug. Uh, they had a drug war just like the United States, but they changed that all around. Now, the money that they used to use to criminalize and detain addicts, they now put into educating children. They put it into treatment for addicts. And they also uh, use that money. If someone is willing to hire a newly abstinent addict, the Portuguese government pays half of their eight, uh, wages for that individual for a year. Often the worker will remain at that job after that year is up. So after almost 20 years of this decriminalization reintegration policy that Portugal has put in, the results are clear. The rate of injecting drug use in Portugal has gone from one in every hundred person to 0.5 in every hundred. That's literally halved. It's insane. Um, in the same period of time, intravenous drug use has doubled in the United States. These basic changes to their system, which was as punitive as the United States as 25 years ago, have created a connection for the individual back to the community. They can wake up with a purpose, go and serve their community and become reintegrated into a social life. They're no longer in that isolated cage. They're in Rat Park now. Next slide, please. So looking into the future of addiction treatment, Oregon just decided to try out the Portuguese model. They decriminalized all drugs in February of this year. If an individual is found to have a small amount of drugs for personal use, they will not be arrested or jailed. They will be issued a fine of $100, which they do not have to pay if they agree to a health ass assessment. Fewer arrests and incarcerations, as well as taxes on marijuana in the state, will free up funds for addiction treatment. Oregon is treating addiction as a health issue rather than a criminal issue. And I look forward to monitoring this program that they've put into place. Next uh, slide, please. So what does this mean for Massachusetts? We've always been an innovative state. We are socially responsible. We're the first state to have a public park, first free public school, first public library, first abolitionist newspaper, and the first state to legalize same-sex marriage. Our approach to addiction is working better than other parts of the country because we do have wonderful social programs, but we could be doing more. And I'm hopeful that we will follow Oregon's lead in our approach to addiction treatment. I can tell you from experience, addiction's morals are not the failing. It's their health. And that's all. If you want to click through my uh, citations, but other than that, that's, uh, that's my presentation. Thank you so much for listening. Sorry. <laughs> I was muted. Sorry. Katie, I was saying um, to myself, evidently, um, Wonderful job, thank you so much. And how, you know, we're still in the middle of this thing and uh, looking at all these different slices of how COVID's impacting different uh, parts of our lives. So uh, thank you for your research on this aspect. Um, and every time you tell me about this rat park, I find it super fascinating and how important it is for a uh, community for every person. So thank you very much, Katie. Um, okay, and our third presenter today, uh, Taylin Layton. Uh, Taylin is also going to be narrating her PowerPoint live, so we'll just uh, give Lisa a moment to pull up Taylin's uh, presentation. Uh, same thing, Lisa, with the uh, seeing your screen, but not the actual PowerPoint. Can you see it now? Not yet. Stop sharing, see if it'll come up now. Can you see it now? Yes. Good. Thank you. Come on, start slideshow. 
<laughs> so Tillin, whenever you're ready, please go ahead. Okay. Can you hear me good? Yes, perfect. Okay, all right. Hi, my name is Taylin, and I did the honors project on the domestic violence during the pandemic, which is why I called it a pandemic within a pandemic, because I don't know if anybody else has heard about it, but it, it is definitely a, a pandemic within itself. Um, you can go to the next slide. Uh, now, I'm sure we all know what domestic violence is, but as I... Uh, our point it's the will intimidate physical assault battery sexual assault or other use and it happens to men and women but we mostly only hear about it in regards to women because men I believe don't really feel they are more intimidated to speak up on on it and they get more nervous they don't feel comfortable and I think it's more of an insecurity thing that they are in that type of situation um you can go to the next slide uh a person who does this type of violence too isn't they don't love that they're victim like that. They're definitely mentally ill. So how has the pandemic affected domestic violence? There's the increase in schools, jobs, and travel opportunities. So it leaves those in violent situations trapped with limited contact to the outside world. And there's perpetrator imposed restrictions, social media, the internet, cell phones. The, the abuser has control over all of that. So as a victim, they have no access to anything really. And the domestic hotlines had prepared for an increase in services. Instead, there was more than a 50% drop, which is kind of shocking. But at the same time, it does make sense because there's no access. And those in those situations do not have the, the accessibility to receive the help that they need. And the pandemic has caused a substantial isolation, leaving domestic violence victims at the hands of their abusers and the abusers get to watch their victim 24 seven. If they don't want them to go outside, they can use the pandemic as an excuse. So in a sense, the pandemic has become an enabler for this type of abuse. Um, you can go to the next slide. Uh, I have a statistic in here, there's one in four women that are affected by domestic violence every day, and there's also one in 10 men as well. And it includes all races, genders, cultures, socioeconomic classes, religions. They're part of it. Has buddy every segment, and you're stuck at home. And usually, people did have a job. They would be that was their escape. They could get away for a little while. And now, if they lost their job because of the pandemic schools closing there's the kids are at home and this leads to possible child abuse or for the child to witness parent violence and it creates a more stressful household than it was even before and not only is the abuser isolating their partner but they could be isolating the child potentially too and as a parent that's an extremely di difficult situation to have with children around and it puts more stress on the victim Besides worrying about themselves, they also have to worry for their child or children if there's more than one in that household. Um, you can go to the next slide. So there's a lot of barriers with this pandemic that stop people from receiving the help. As I said before, they're able to watch their victims 24 seven. They have access to their phones even more now. And with everything closing too, I forgot to mention, all of the shelters that we used to have for people with domestic violence situations, they're either shut down or capacity is limited because of the pandemic. They can't have so many people. Hotels weren't available. All these shelters, nobody has access to anything anymore. Granted, things are starting to slowly open back up, but it still makes it a lot harder for a victim to receive the help that they actually need. Um, you can go to the next slide. So how do we help? This is a very complicated situation when it comes to helping somebody that you may know that is in a domestic violence situation. You can express your concerns on them, but and how you're worried about their safety and well-being, but they can't just leave. And you have that's like a complicated thing to understand for somebody in that situation. You have to, I guess, I don't want to say you have to be have been through it to understand it because that's nobody wants that. But you shouldn't confront the abuser yourself because that can 
get you hurt in the end more than anything. And you don't want to force the victim. They have to be able to do it on their own as much as you want to help them. And even if you don't feel comfortable, you, sh you could tell a trusted adult or go to the authorities. And you have to be conscientious at the situation at hand, because if there are kids involved, obviously that makes it a lot worse. It's not just the partner or your friend that's in that domestic violence situation. There's also the children. And it's, it becomes a safety issue with the children too. Not that it's not a safety issue for the victim in itself, but you have to be mindful because it can make the situation 10 times worse for the victim. Because what if the abuser doesn't get convicted and then they go back home to where the victim is and then it makes the abuse 10 times worse. So you have to be really mindful of everything and you have to remind them that it's not their fault and you have to be there for them and try to convince them. I'm going to get slightly personal. I have multiple people in my life that have dealt with domestic violence situations. And just recently, I actually had to help a friend out of one because she needed help moving out because of her situation with her significant other where he put his hands on her. And I, I was worried for her safety, but going to her apartment where he was, I was also worried for my safety. And I had to remind myself not to say anything to him and to just help her move out. I even have some family members that go through it too. And it's really sad to watch, but there's not, not that there's not anything that you can do, but at the same time, I kind of feel helpless and that I can't help them. But with the pandemic, it makes it 10 times worse because what are you, I feel like you can't really do very much with it. Um, you can go to the next slide. I included the hotline in my thing in my PowerPoint because I feel like it's not talked about enough and it's not given out enough for others to know that there's a way. Because if the abuser's not at home, there's a chance that they could get online or have find access to a phone and call this hotline and they'll be able to get help if they need it and know that they're not alone. There's hotlines for plenty of things. This, it's just so sad to watch people that you know or love go through a situation like this with domestic violence because you know it's not their fault and as much as they believe that it is I've had my own situations not completely domestic violence I have went through a whole relationship where it was mentally abusive and that includes domestic violence too in a sense with the mental abuse and it's not fun and I used to I remember feeling the way that I did those all those years ago and to come out of it was relieving and it made me feel 10 times better and when I look back on it now I know that it wasn't me because back then I did think it was my own fault and now I know that it's not my fault and I feel like we all have to be there for one another what what's the saying there's a saying where it's you know you're supposed to be there for your neighbors I'm trying to think of the saying it's not on the top of my head right now <laughs> but I do think that this pandemic has affected the domestic violence rates entirely. And the last slide is just my work cited. Taylin, thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, another, another slice of how COVID uh, has impacted our, our world. Um, and also a great example uh, for our audience, how um, our, our honor students often select a project to study where there is some personal stake. And I think so far, all of our presenters um, have, have shown that aspect. So thank you very much, Taylin. Um, and our final presenter today, um, Brandon Souza. Um, and uh, Brandon has a PowerPoint in which he, he narrated um, within the PowerPoint. So we'll be playing that in just a moment as Lisa cues that up. Um, and we did lose a few minutes to some technical difficulties. So um, I'm, I'm willing to and going to ask you if you can stick around to maybe 105, maybe 110 for those of you who can stay. So we will have enough time for questions and answers if you're, if you're able. Um, but for now, we will uh, hear Brendan's presentation. Gods and myths in your bathroom. We are going to be looking at how ancient deities relate to the modern myths that we have today. We're going to compare these gods and myths between the Eastern and Western Hemisphere, and we're going to... Uh, Lisa, we somehow lost the sound. I don't know why. I'm going to take two 
on that? So first, let's look at some well-known Western toilet deities. The first is Cloacina, an ancient Roman goddess that was invoked to clear clogs. Eventually, Cloacina's role as a goddess was taken over by the goddess Venus. The Romans also had Crepticus, a god of flatulence, and Stercutus, a god of odor. In all likelihood, Crepticus was an invention of Catholic satirists. While Stercutus may have also been such a thing, other works suggest that he may have been real and was a goddess of fertility. Then in ancient Babylon, we had Sulak, a demon of the privy, that was considered to be a source of medical maladies such as strokes. Some common myths surrounding the bathroom are Bloody Mary, an apparition that appears in the mirror summoned through a ritual, and Alora da Banero, a blonde in the bathroom, a ghost from Brazilian folklore. It follows many of the same rules and rituals as Bloody Mary, although its ritual involving its summoning can involve hair. Eastern toilet deities include Juxin, a Korean goddess of the toilet from Korean shamanism. She differs from many of the other gods on this list in that she is antagonistic in nature. Rituals are only done for her as a form of appeasement to prevent her from killing someone. In Japan, there's the Kawaiakami, a spirit from Shintoism that's viewed as a protective spirit that would keep people safe in the bathroom. On the other end, there's the Kanami, a Japanese yokai. It would appear in bathrooms that weren't protected by a kami. In China, there's Zigu or Maogu, a latrine goddess whose worship was somewhat secretive and would involve rituals that had dolls that could be used for fortune telling. Popular Eastern myths include Hanako-san, a Japanese spirit summoned in bathrooms via ritual, Akamanto, another Japanese spirit that would appear in public bathrooms, killing its victims based on which paper they asked for. Korea has a similar story as well. In Korea, there's the Byonso and Dutkan Guishin. Both are types of ghosts that would hang from the ceiling in bathrooms to play with your hair. With this, we can look at a quick comparison between the deities' myths. In Western culture, a lot of these gods are primarily defunct. This is due to Western culture being primarily Abrahamic, pushing out a lot of these older faiths. Whereas in Eastern religion, since Abrahamism never took much of a ground, some of these faiths can still be practiced in small pockets here and there, such as Japan or North Korea. Both, however, have beings that are wholly negative or wholly positive, and there's a focus on death through disease or fertility through these beings. So let's first look at Bloody Mary. Bloody Mary likely originates from 20th century marriage or coffin rituals. These were rituals done primarily by young women that would perform a ritual at a mirror to see their future husband or to see if they would die before they wed. There also exist variations of Mary's grave myths in various states throughout the United States. Bloody Mary would be summoned through a mirror and is usually depicted as a witch or a ghost. What exactly happens afterward is incredibly varied, although it's usually a wholly negative experience. An explanation for this myth is possibly hallucinations caused by the dim lighting and the fixation on the mirror. Ultimately, the Bloody Mary myth is a form of scrying, a religious or ritualistic practice that will involve using objects to tell a fit future. Objects such as crystal balls, mirrors, standing water, bones, or even cards. It was a popular practice in the 20th century to use such methods to predict who their future husband would be, although the appearance of the skull or the Grim Reaper meant that they would die before being wed. But as women's place in society shifted, the ritual did too. It became Bloody Mary over time as the wholly negative aspects were usually kept and the aspects related to marriage were dropped. Next, let's look at Hanoko-san, what is often referred to as the Japanese equivalent of Bloody Mary. Hanoko-san originates from around the 1950s and is usually depicted as a young girl in a red skirt or dress with a bob haircut. She is usually said to haunt the school bathrooms upon the third floor and is summoned through a ritual that usually includes the usage of three knocks. Some versions involve her killing those who summon her, either through pulling her into the toilet, into a portal through hell, or through summoning a monster that would devour them for interrupting her. 
Hanako-san is a spirit of a dead girl, and her death usually ranges from between being murdered to suicide to being a victim of an Allied air raid during World War II. However, something interesting happens when we compare Hanako-san to another popular piece of Japanese media from the 1950s. This particular media I'm referring to is the original release of Godzilla. Now, both are from the 50s, as I mentioned, and both are entities created through Allied forces attacks on Japan, and both are destructive in nature. Both are essentially anti-war in their themes and revolve around the destruction war can create. In the 1950s, Japan was still reeling from World War II and still suffered greatly from the hands of the Allied nations attacks on them during World War II. Much of media that came out during this time frame often had a very heavy anti-war sentiment. Next, we're going to look at another piece of Japanese media, uh, an anime called Ghost Stories, and we're going to compare it to a couple other forms of media. So Ghost Stories is an anime that debuted in Japan in around the year 2000 and was released within the United States in 2005. It's based on a book of the same name, and the plot followed a group of students that would exercise spirits that were released due to urbanization that was happening in the town they lived in. What we're most particularly interested in, however, is episode two. The reason we're interested in this episode is because it greatly revolves around its depictions of Hanako-san and Akamanto. Hanako-san plays a minor role compared to Akamano, however, the role she plays is meant to fit exactly her appearances in her stories. She Akamanto, however, adopts a small part of Hanako-san's myth, particularly the part where you could be dragged into hell through the bathroom. When we compare this to more modern pieces of media, however, we see a few changes. For instance, we'll look at toilet-bound Hanako-kun. The most immediate change is the character's gender is changed. This is done as a way to subvert expectations, even within the series itself. The series itself also barely looks at the myth itself, but rather looks at the relationship between myths and people, how when one changes, the other changes with it. Very much in modern media, the myth itself is less important, and it's more of a segue to look at certain points of culture. But when we look at the English dubbing of Ghost Stories, we see something completely different. The script was completely rewritten to turn it into a dark comedy rather than the drama it was previously. The humor within it is common for the mid-2000 time frames in the U.S. with a lot of edgy humor revolving around race and religion. This is a look into how a different culture that has absolutely no identity with the figures within the series really don't care as much. And it's a look into how we treat certain things in the 2000 time frame within the U.S. Now we're going to look at the Korean goddess Chuksin. She is one of the many gods in the Gassin faith. She is depicted as a woman with long black hair and is also depicted as a white cloth. Unlike most other traditional Far Eastern religions, Chuksin is a wholly antagonistic god. While the other Gassin gods receive regular ritual worship, Chukchin has only received it as a form of appeasement to prevent her from killing someone. In particular, she's antagonistic towards the goddess of her hearth. These stories between them two used as a way to prevent disease from cross-contamination between the kitchen and the bathroom. Now, when we look at Korean Gwisin and keep in mind of Chukchin, something interesting happens. Gwisin are usually depicted as women and are primarily seen dressed in all white with long black hair. Revenge was also a common story element within these myths. So what we have is both Chuksin and depictions of Gwisin are both the same visually and thematically, as Chuksin is a goddess that is angry towards the other gods due to her punishment, and Gwisin are ghosts and spirits of people who have a revenge that they wish to complete. They both tend to wear long white clothing, and they both tend to have long black hair, and they're both women. It's very probable that depictions of Gwisin are leftover bits of Gassin faith that have stuck around through mythology. Lastly, we're going to look at something that pops up between both Eastern and Western hemispheres quite a bit and that is most myths can follow a certain archetype. Most beings are ritually summoned, 
the number three is often very prevalent, the entity is usually a woman and is usually the victim of something. And the end process is usually death for those that participate. Thank you, Brandon. I think Brandon's topic just goes to show that you never know what someone's going to explore in their final project, the gods of the bathroom. <laughs> so um, I want to thank all of our four presenters today. Uh, maybe we could give a virtual round of applause for them. Nice job, everyone. Thank you. And uh, we only have a few minutes left. Uh, we did have some technical difficulties. So if any of you are able to stay for, let's say, another five or eight minutes or so, I'd like to um, open up the floor to audience questions. We have some comments coming in the chat as well. But uh, if anybody would like to ask a question aloud to one of our presenters, uh, Selena, Katie, Taylin, or Brandon, um, now is the time. So please go ahead. I think I have one for Katie. Um, I was interested in the in the discussion that you had of Portugal and the way that Portugal had halved its its drug use. Um, the did I understand right from your statistics was like one percent of the Portuguese population drug users. What's America's percentage? The U.S. I don't have the U.S. Uh, percentage on me right now, but it was one percent of the Portuguese. So one in every hundred people right. in Portugal were IV drug users, not just drug users. They were using right. intravenously. Right, because I was I was kind of asking myself like, wow, that's such a that's such a, a really drastic way of changing the way. Why would they do that? And then I got to that statistic and was like, oh, that's why. Yeah, they had that's to a, that's make a, a change. Problem. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your question. Thank you, Kelly. And it looks like Colleen has her hand up. Go ahead, Colleen. So this is more of a comment to Taylor. And first, everyone, fantastic job. I enjoyed all the presentations, very important work. So kudos. Um, but um, to Taylor, um, there was another honor student I was working with who was taking so uh, two into a social problems class with me. And she was also looking at domestic violence. And one of the things that she was focusing on is the lack of resources for men as victims of domestic violence. And um, she had done some content analysis of even websites that offer assistance toward um, for, for victims. And what she had found lacking was uh, specifically for males. So I just wanted to kind of say that that uh, it was an interesting connection. Maybe I can put the two of you together just so that you can talk about uh, some of your, your the common themes that came up and, and some of your, um, you know, maybe even where the research needs to go from here. So thank yeah, you. Sure. Thank you, Colleen. Um, I can uh, share uh, email addresses between mm -hmm. Colleen and Tillin, uh, and you can make that connection. That's great. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, we've got a lot of bravos and awesomes in the chat for all of you. Um, and uh, Katie, did you ever look into Amsterdam's approach to drug use? So I didn't hear anything in terms of like drug treatment. I know that they also have a couple of drugs legalized, um, like marijuana. I think they also have some, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Selena, but um, hallucinogenics legalized there too. Um, I just, I don't know about their treatment model. I know Switzerland has a really great treatment model too, though. If you're looking into that, highly recommend looking to Switzerland because theirs is crazy. It's so good. They had a similar issue um, to Portugal and like it was also really, really bad. They actually legalized, like not decriminalized, legalized heroin. Um, yeah, and it, it ended up working for them. So, yeah. Thank you. And uh Bob Rack, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I had a question for Selena. If uh, she uh, looked at or or if she's been seeing any movement in the change in the refugee status for climate uh, refugees with the new administration and with John Kerry and as a liaison for climate and is there has there been any any movement in that direction? So far, I haven't seen many uh, improvement. Um, 
there's a lot of advocacy advocacy groups and uh, protests uh, protest, protesting happening uh, happening with the whole immigration process. But um, there hasn't really been any change. I mean, there's been some here and there, but as a whole, like there needs there's a lot that needs to be done. Because we're looking at almost uh, 200 million, you know, environmental refugees in the, you know, in the next few years. So <laughs> it's going to be something that I believe the status should change for that. Even, even what we're seeing right now from uh, coming from uh, Central America, a lot of the movement of of the immigrants from Central America due to the droughts and everything and down there. Mm -hmm. in the nation, so. Oh yeah, South America, when I was looking into the whole, um, with Brazil's uh, environmental degradation, it was like heartbreaking what they're going through and continue to go through. You're making me think, Selena, of the, you know, the, the power of corporations and um, how can that be dismantled? And uh, even if we don't want to participate um, in these corporations, it's it's they're so intertwined with our daily lives. So, you know, you, you go to the market and try to buy a tomato, and it has an incredible history <laughs> connected to a, a lot of ugliness and uh, how di how how difficult it is to um, combat these things when they're so intertwined um, in in everyday systems. So uh, you. you Appreciate the light that you, you shined on, on that. Right, I completely agree. It is hard to cut back on things that we do every day. And if we do it all suddenly, it would just be chaos. So I think it needs to be definitely gradual. But, mm -hmm. And we also have problems in our own country with uh, the Asian cop. I don't know if people are familiar with how that's been uh, moving up the Mississippi River and they're trying to keep it out of the Great Lakes. It was brought in to control uh, algae in catfish farms. But then with the fl major flood in uh, 1983, a lot of the, the catfish farms were flooded and so the carp got out. And so there's, there's a major effort to try and control them. They're the ones that jump out of the water. I don't know if you've ever seen those if you have a look on the Asian carp thing, you can see them flying out of the water and everything. And they, they so there's a big effort to try and control them. And there's also the multinational corporation of the Pebble Mine. I don't know if people are familiar with that in uh, uh, in Alaska, trying to uh, create the world's largest copper mine right near the largest salmon uh, run in the world and uh, in that area. So there's, but there's been people pulling out of that. So I don't know where it's going. It was, it was kind of killed by the EPA, but then in the last administration, they had talks to bring it back up. And uh, so I think it's probably uh, kind of slowing down again. So hopefully that doesn't, doesn't happen. Can you do me a favor and put your, um, your email in the chat? I would love to talk to you more about this. Okay, sure. Thank you. And I, I think that um, Bob's comment, and it, it makes me think of one of the um, beautiful things about the honors program is that, you know, students are participating from all disciplines in all areas of the college. And so we get these uh, wonderful research projects and then um, for faculty members who work with them, you know, it's such a great opportunity for our students to um, latch onto the expertise of these faculty members. Uh, sometimes that's an, an opportunity that students don't get until much, much later in their uh, educational careers. So uh, for all the faculty members who are on this call, I would like to thank you um, for working with our students because the program cannot run <laughs> without faculty involvement. Um, and also to um, our college administration who has really fully supported the honors program um, and is, is in its corner. Um, so I don't know if President Douglas is still on this call, but especially to President Douglas and to uh, uh, Suzanne Buglioni, have uh, shown great support of honors. So thank you so much. And it looks like Mary, you have a question and this will probably be our last one as we're um, getting closer to 10 after the hour. So go ahead, Mary. Oh, I'm sorry, it's not really so much of a question. It's just Bob reminded me um, and, and Selena's presentation reminded me of um, one of the, the issues in, in this country, and I think I'm sure that it has similar um, in other countries as well, but is, is really a revolving door between business and 
um, places like or organizations like the EPA. Um, so I, I recently read a book, um, and I apologize, I can't remember the name of it right now. It's by Robert Balot, who is a lawyer. Um, and it was about a, a landmark case against Teflon that um, is Teflon was poisoning the water. And they actually, they filed a, a class action lawsuit and they, um, on behalf of several communities that were impacted by polluted water. And they actually won something really interesting, which is medical monitoring for the people who were impacted. Um, anyway, it's a really interesting book because he really, it's kind of, can be a little hard to read because it's written by a lawyer. So it's sort of, <laughs> there's a lot of kind of legalese in it, but it's also a really interesting look at kind of the ins and outs and how he kept trying to get information and couldn't get the information from the company, how they gave him the runaround, how he got the runaround from state officials and how the, the local governments were complicit in not providing information to the people about what was in their water. So it's it's just a really scary and interesting case to look at. Yeah, it's become a major, the PFAS and, P, PFAS and PFAS have become a major emergent contaminant in the, the water, drinking water. And uh, a lot of the utilities are having to deal with it right now. Thank you for saying that uh, resource because I'm definitely going to look into reading the book. Thank you. Okay, um, I think we may be uh, out of time. We're a little bit over time. Um, so I think we should close up now. I don't see anybody else's hand raised and I think we went through the chat. So once again, um, to all of our presenters, uh, Selena, Katie, Taylin, and Brandon, Thank you all so much and thanks for going first. It's never easy to go first. <laughs> uh, we do have um, three more days of the honor showcase with so many students. So I'm um, hoping that you may be able to uh, drop in again on one of the other days, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday this week, noon to one, uh, kind of the same bat time, same bat channel. For those of you of a certain age, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, so thank you again to our presenters. Thank you to the audience members. Really appreciate you stopping by. It's a super busy time of year. Um, and uh, I think the college has always been really great at supporting our honor students. Um, this is our first big showcase uh, virtual. Um, thank you for helping make it go really well. So thanks everyone. I think we'll say goodbye. Um, if our presenters can hang on for a couple minutes, um, but everyone else, thank you. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye. <laughs>